Hello, and welcome to, More Intelligent Tomorrow, a wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. How can we find transformative value with AI, and not be distracted by all of the possible solutions? We'll discuss this and more with Shamik Kundu on today's episode. And now, your host, Ben Taylor. Shamik, thank you so much for being on this show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for having me. So how long have you been a data nerd, and when did your love of data start? Sure. Uh, so I was a management consultant for um, for about a decade in, in London. Um, and then when I moved to Standard Chartered Bank, I actually did find myself at a choice of, you know, do I go the traditional strategy route where a management consultant comes and joins the strategy team, or do I try and do something more uh, focused? And I, I chose the latter. And, and actually, right from day one, my role involved initially fixing client data uh, for the corporate bank, then a little bit in finance. And then when the bank needed its first chief data officer for um, primarily for regulatory data quality reasons. Uh, I just happened to be there at the right time. Uh, so yeah, I became chief data officer back in 2014. Um, I've had various CIO roles in parallel, including running our data lake and our analytics related technology. Um, but that role has stayed with me for the last six years. Um, I suppose a lot of the work as a chief data officer in the, in banking, at least in, in the initial days, was very defensive. It was about data quality. It was about um, making data available for regulatory reporting. But in the last two to four years, I would say two to three years, it's uh, much more focused on getting um, analytics enablement, AI enablement, et cetera, as well. Okay. So in banking, a lot of our followers, they might be starting their data science journey. And hopefully you'll forgive this stereotype, but I think for new data scientists that are starting out, joining a large bank might feel kind of boring and less exciting compared to joining something like a Facebook or some social media app or new phone app. What what would you say to them? Uh, so I, I guess this is the end of that stereotype. If I mentioned working for a bank, do I have to wear a suit? And am I just working on transaction-based data looking for loan approvals? What's your response to that? It is an uh, interesting stereotype, and you're right. Most people will think, what does a bank do with data? Yeah, probably it decides how to lend, or if you're an insurer, you decide how to underwrite insurance. But actually, there's a lot, lot more that happens. I mean, first of all, that lending itself, very interesting. If, you, if you're if you trying to lend to our network, Asia, Africa, and Middle East, you don't necessarily have the same kinds of external data that you can use to um, traditional data from bureaus, et cetera, to decide who to lend to. So even the alternate data that you use, I mean, we ourselves have just started experimenting with it, but there are banks in Africa, for example, that use your mobile activity to decide whether to give you a loan today to help you buy produce for, for the market and then sell and repay by end of day. This is in Kenya with M-Pesa, for example. We don't do it ourselves, but others have done it. So that's one thing. I mean, don't underplay that. Actually, when you have to lend, particularly in our kind of Asian African footprint, you need to be very creative with the kinds of data you use. Second thing, of course, is there's a whole amount of work around fraud, around cybersecurity, and particularly around financial crime, which does involve a lot of very interesting analysis. Um, I mean, I have literally seen screens which look like the sophisticated networks on the Minority Report uh, movie many years ago. They don't, they're not up in the air and they're not about predicting crimes. Wow. So listening to your response, I feel like that stereotype could not be further from the truth because... Going into these new markets, you have to invent what are the data sets we're going to collect in this market because you don't have these standards and um, processes to find. That, that definitely changes my perspective. It almost makes me think that every country you work in is almost its internal startup within the company. So, Absolutely. yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yeah, which is and actually nice. sometimes models that you, not sometimes, in many cases, models that you make for one country will not be applicable or transferable to another country. So you've got to think about. Yes, you know you're going to do a propensity modeling to see what the customer is likely to buy. Or yes, you know the basics of the credit model. But which which features are going to be important in one country are not necessarily the same ones as in another country. For example, in some countries, um, in a, some of our experimental stuff, we've seen which mobile network you are in might suggest different credit worthiness because some mobile networks are more for prepaid, some are more for postpaid. And that can differ by country, right? So absolutely, it, I love your characterization of every country being a startup. In many ways, that's what it is. Yeah. 
in addition to the variety and the uh, of the key use cases and the data set, there's also a question of purpose. I mean, I've heard many data scientists talk about, you know, yes, it's great that I'm doing this cool data science, but how much impact is my ability to predict the right movie for somebody to watch going to have versus actually uh, here's 1.2 billion people around the world who don't have access to financial services. Um, and or many of them have, but they can't get the loans or the offers be, uh, the, that they need. And actually using AI and alternate data, we might be able to expand whether we directly offer it or through partners, that safe space in which more people can get service. So our, our mission is here, for, our statement is here for good and our mission is spreading commerce and prosperity in Asia, Africa and Middle East. Yeah, that's great. So if I'm a data scientist optimizing the hue of blue on a marketing campaign, the, the hit back at me is, well, what's my purpose or how, how is this going to benefit society for better? So Shamik, if I heard you right, you, the bank is over 100 years old? 100 and... It's over 160 years old. Okay. Wow. So how can a bank, how can any organization that old compete against hedge funds and some of the new up and coming companies that are using the latest technology? How can you stay competitive? Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting point. I mean, look, I, I, there's a broader bank wide view, but I can certainly give you my view from where I stand. I think there's two things, really. I mean, first of all, what makes something stand for 160 years? It's not it's not the ability to make profits alone. I think what's most important is is winning and retaining trust trust of the communities that we serve, right? And I would say a closer home on this technology and data and digital space, the openness to learn, to invest, and to basically accept that we are not um, uh, the best in, in many things and we must do more all the time. I think to some extent having that almost paranoia to say, we've got to improve, we've got to learn and adopt from, adapt from, and adopt and adapt, um, that's, that's pretty critical as well. Uh, so the mention of trust, how can you maintain that with AI? We see examples in the news where you'll have AI with bias or you'll have AI where the predictions aren't generalizing in the real world. How do you maintain that spirit of trust when you think of AI processes? So I think a combination of these three things, lots of demystification and education inside the bank, uh, creating the tooling for responsible use of AI and making sure that we are helping contribute to the broader societal and regulatory environment around AI. Uh, all of those things are important. But actually, if you step back, the most important thing is to recognize this, frankly. That's where it starts. You have to recognize the importance of using AI and data more broadly responsibly. If you don't, then none of this thing will happen. Okay. So based on the experience you've had, it sounds like there's a lot of things that are working well. What is the recipe to success that you might share with other leaders when you think of going from raw data to value, from A to Z? What? How do you go from A to Z, from data to value? You go Z to A. You don't go A to Z. You start with the value. You 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 work with what what are what is the answer? What, what are the problems that you're trying to solve? And then you look at whether it's AI or just a simple data um, visualization or anything else that's the solution. That would be my, my most important suggestion to people. So to, in a way, doing taking that approach, maybe this is me speaking personally, that a lot of people get trapped with a shiny new toy. They get really excited about some new technology. They want to apply deep learning. They want to use this new technology for any use case. And in your answer, you're talking about find a problem worth solving, get stakeholders, get buy-in, and then go backwards. Yep, absolutely. I think that is the only way to do it because the, in theory, the possibilities of data and analytics are endless, right? So if you start with, let's just figure out what all data we have and do something useful with it. There's so many directions you can go. And and it's it's very difficult, I mean, unless you're running a very small company focused in one area. For a large bank like ours and for most large organizations, it's so difficult. I was talking to a pharma company yesterday and they were asking, what can you do? There are so many things they could do with that data from you know improving drug delivery to coming up with new ways of uh, new ways of building drugs to actually discovering new drugs to looking at the results of past testing to see whether this drug might work somewhere else it's just bewildering how many things you can do 
if you start with let's build an asset and an AI platform and a data science capability that will somehow automatically gen- generate results, you're going to probably generate several small results. If you start with five North Stars in that pharma example, okay, what we really want to do is to dramatically improve our ability to deliver new drugs um, to market. If you make that as your North Star and then work backward from that, you have far more chances of success. Yeah, that's a fair point. So you're, you're a data geek. That This job isn't going to get boring anytime soon because it's changing all the time. What are you excited about when you think about a more intelligent tomorrow? What are you excited about five or 10 years from now, whether it's at work or something you might appreciate at home when it comes to technology? Sure. Um, so from, from this relatively narrow data space, I think there's a couple of things that... that um, that really interests me and, that, and and sorry, that, that really excite me because I think they'll happen. And there's one that I'm hopeful, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, the things that I think will happen is we will move on from using data and analytics simply to decide which hue of, uh, of color, which color should the screen be, or even in our case, you know, to decide what new financial product somebody might want to solving the bigger problems in all our industries. I mean, and that includes, for example, how do we use analytics to, to solve for climate change uh, or, or even in financial services, worrying less about incremental revenues or cost reductions alone, but how do we fundamentally transform so that it we are able to fund, for example, sustainable uh, energy investments? How do we do that with confidence using data and analytics as a way of driving that? So I think there's a whole piece about purpose of data and analytics and data science. I would see that purpose becoming much higher, and I would see the impact from data science becoming much bigger. And wishful thinking here, but hopefully we'll see more and more of that in the current crisis itself with data providing a huge uh, fillip. It is doing already, to be fair, uh, to the way in which we come up with drugs and vaccines and treatment pro- protocols, etc. So that's one big uh, thing, which I'm pretty certain will happen. Uh, the second we already spoke about somewhat, I think we're going to get much, much more focused on responsible use of data and AI. And I think it's absolutely essential. It's a bit like climate change itself. We've, we've been irresponsible in the past and we need to get our act together. It's the same thing here. Um, again, I'm pretty certain it will happen because regulators, industry folks, data scientists, they, everybody is getting united in a coalition to say, no, we, we, we have a responsibility, just like doctors have a responsibility to, to you know, not do harm. We as the data community have a responsibility for that as well. So these two excite me and I'm personally looking forward to spending time on both of these topics. The third one, which I hope will happen, I'm not 100% certain, is is greater democratization of data and analytics. And I don't mean necessarily democratization in the sense of just individuals, but I mean, even if you are a small startup in a new area, you don't get bogged down because you don't have access to the data that a big bank or a big tech firm has, but that through the use of you know, open data and, and data sharing and, um, and, you know, the regulatory framework that allows people to share data easily, that you have the ability to make a difference, even if you are not sitting on top of a treasure trove of data. And that requires some fundamental structural changes where, you know, companies are almost forced to share the data they have um, in a more open way. And, and just the, the fact that you are hoarding data doesn't make you uh, a monopoly. I'm not sure if that will happen um, because that has many different regulatory implications, but certainly that's an area I think we should look towards as well. So one of the questions that comes up a lot, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to pay, I'm going to call out this issue in the startup community. When an executive is thinking of AI, a lot of times they think they need to build everything from scratch. They have to, if you're going to use XGBoost, if you're going to use these algorithms, they have to build it from scratch. And that's because they're stuck on this IP issue. They think all AI is IP. How do you make the decision of build versus buy when you're developing algorithms? I imagine some you can buy and others there's there's no mar- there's no product. You have to yeah. it. So how do you how do you take that approach when you consider outside vendors? Yeah, I mean, look, I think first of all we are a very prolific buyer um, of of um, of AI related services and software. Um, and prolific doesn't mean we go to one firm and buy lots of it. I think we look for, um, I think this whole space is so new in many ways that there is no single firm, startup or otherwise, or even an established uh, technology or firm that can claim to have everything they need. So so what what we do, and, and much of this is, is, is public domain as well, is we 
pick companies that have a focus in a particular area, let's say fraud or financial crime or customer onboarding or even, you know, lending decisions, etc. So I, we have a, I, I, I'd like to think, a very proud record of core development with lots of start, small startups across this whole data and analytics space. I mean, I can count 10, just 10 that have, you know, very substantial contracts with us who were all uh, single digit startups when they started with us. Some of them have become unicorns now. So when it comes to recruiting for data science, there's a lot of different technologies, a, a lot of different skill sets and competencies that people are trying to develop. For people listening to this podcast that want to pursue a career and, and go work for Standard Chartered Bank, what are the skill sets and competencies that you would recommend? How, how, do, you, how do you review or filter candidates? I mean, look, I, I don't directly recruit data scientists myself, but more broadly, I would say, um, um, obviously, we're looking for technically proficient people. That goes without saying. Nobody would say, I, I want a weak data scientist or a weak data engineer. So obviously, we're looking for technical proficiency. But I think beyond that, some of the things that you need to have to work for us is you need to have that passion for, you know, that purpose about what, what you want to do with it. Because if you are... Uh, or, or at least you, you need to have an interest or, or a desire to make a difference with what you are doing, right? I know it sounds a bit wishy-washy, but the reality is, you know, when you are, there are banks and there are many other firms that all work on data and analytics. I think if the idea of using data and analytics for a purpose like ours uh, and, and the idea of working for a global but kind of more Asian, African, Middle East bank attracts you, then this is... an that then this is a good place. The other thing I personally look for is curiosity. I mean, things move so fast in this space. Uh, I had somebody ask me recently, uh, I'm just starting my career in data. What Hadoop book should I, what Hadoop courses should I do? And one of our data engineers said, ask her not to do Hadoop anymore. It's done. Now, whether that's true or not, the reality is it moves so fast that, you know, even at senior levels, if you don't have the 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 hunger to continuously learn and reinvent yourself, it doesn't work. So just being proficient in what you are doing today does not work. The curiosity and the desire to learn continuously is super critical. So Shamik, I, I really appreciate your time. I I've I feel like there's so many things we've hit on and it wouldn't be very hard to interview you for hours with some of the experiences that you've gained. So I don't think I'm gonna look at a, a large bank again the same way again, especially yours, where it's a startup of startups. The problem diversity is changing constantly. I don't get any sense that you're bored with the work that you do. Absolutely not. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. And really appreciate our partnership. Thanks again.